Hello all, welcome to our uh, second lecture in week two about indoor relief in prisons. Um, as the populations grew in number and complexity, how did punishment of lawbreakers evolve? Uh, which practices in the 19th century still influence our practices today? Um, which ones have proven to be ineffective, counterproductive, and dangerous? And uh, we may see some connections with those two ideas that um, They've been proven ineffective, but unfortunately we may still be using some of those today. So we talked last week about colonial times, and we talked about how there was not a real imprisonment in colonial America um, as a form of punishment, that there were not prisons, there were jails. And these were just kind of like holding areas um, until someone could be tried, and then they would receive, you know, pun public punishment most often, um, is what we talked about last week. Um, so. During the late 18th century, uh, states began to construct prisons to hold convicted people. Um, in New York, uh, the first prison is um, contracted in 1791 and completed in 1799. Um, it becomes the state's first significant capital expense that actually spent on prisons uh, before they spent on schools. Uh, it's a leading expenditure. They spend more on that than they do on schools, roads, canals, or the military. Um, and the, op uh, the operating funds, excuse me, uh, were to come from the convicted labor. Um, they were expected to work. Um, uh, it contained a chapel, a communal dining hall, rooms to accommodate eight, and some solitary uh, cells. Um, things that were punished by sentence to prison were things like grand larceny, burglary, forgery, passing counterfeit money, and manslaughter. 75% um, were white men, 17% were black men, 5% were white women, and 3% were black women. Uh, by 1800, there were prisons in Georgia, Kentucky, Maryland, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Vermont, and Virginia. Um, the purpose of these was still reform at this period. Um, you know, they were to develop regular labor, sobriety, cleanliness, sexual abstinence. Um, during this period, they finally segregate women, women, men and women, and they're prevented from seeing their families for months at a time. Um, so some of those changes are positive. Um, we're going to see that, you know, maybe women are a little safer in these, in these, in these spaces, um, being, being separated from men, but, you know, we're going to see separation of the family unit. Um, and you're going to see a lot of um, commonalities between the lecture, the first lecture this week, um, where we're talking about these Protestant um, white middle class values of labor and sobriety, and and this idea that that that's how to fix things. That that if if we can get them to be sober and work and clean and and be more in line with middle class values, then that will reform them. Um, prisons ranged from open air with no walls to underground cells. Um, some encouraged religious reform more than others. Um, others were violent and oppressive. Um, you know, religious reform was not always the worst thing for them to experience. There was some gentleness, maybe some godliness. Um, you know, some prisoners were treated very poorly. Um, the Auburn system, which um, is in 1817, um, and there will be other prisons based on this system. Um, solitary cells at night labor in silence at various industries during the day. Um, all was intended to be a time for contemplation and repentance. Um, they were issued uniforms in a number, which is a new development during uh, this system. Um, and a new industrial relationship with inmates reflects the economic industrialization. So in the beginning, um, you don't see this connection between crime and forcing them to do industry, forcing them to work. Um, they were enforced lockstep when walking to their cell, dining hall, and work. Um, the strict formation was to prevent communication. As you can see, it was very solitary. Um, in 1826, there were 635 inmates, 22 were women, and they were all in total silence. Um, they did not build a separate facility for women because women were needed for the washing, ironing, and mending. mending. Um, the first all-women's prison will, will come about in New York in 1893. So you can see that's, that's quite a bit from where we are right now. Um, the Pennsylvania system, 
uh, is a penal institution that separated offenders from each other and all earthly corruption so that they could repent and be reformed. Um, being penitent equals penitentiary, so that's where that word comes from. Um, the identity is a number, the same uniforms, and a short haircut. No communication with the outside world, a complete isolation. Um, they were hooded upon arrival and taken to the cell, uh, presented with a Bible and writing materials, uh, provided a large cell with sleeping and working space. Um, and then, you know, and we have videos that, that will give you more information this week. Um, these uh, even had flushing toilets. They were very modern, um, which was really a new invention during this period and kind of a novelty. Um, isolation intended the beautiful gate of temple leading to a happy life and peaceful end to heaven. Um, so there's really um, an idea of reforming not only the person but their soul. Um, and the work was not as hard as in the Auburn system um, and there was no labor on Sunday because it was the Sabbath. So you can see that, that this Pennsylvania system is a much more religious system. Um, both the Auburn and the Pennsylvania system believed in the ability to change and reform people. They both relied on silence, separation, discipline, regimentation, regimentation sorry, and industry. They believed in the benefits of isolation without uh, realizing the need for human contact. I'm sure that you can imagine um, that kind of silence and um, separation, how it, would, how it would wear on a person. Um, while Bloth claimed order and careful discipline, investigation of suspicious deaths revealed the, the treatment, um, what we would consider torture today. Um, you know, both had evidence of inmates uh, going insane because of the way they were treated. I'm, uh, Charles Dickens uh, bemoaned the tampering with the mysteries of the brain was worse than the tortures of the body. So what he was saying was that that what's perpetrated on their minds in this kind of prison um, is actually worse um, than what could have than what could have been done to their bodies. Um, so this is our uh, our list of references for this lecture. Um, you're going to see that I referenced um, the Auburn Correctional Facility, where you can go look at a timeline of their history. Um, there's also a timeline of the Eastern State Penitentiary. Uh, those would be great places if prisons is what you want to do. Um, go there and look and just start to get an idea of, of how these things change over time because they're going to stretch you know, from the roots of them up until some of them go up to the 20th century so that you can really get an idea and start to work on your projects. Uh, you guys have a great week.